Well, I'm delighted to be here. Glad we were able to record this lecture, um, which I'm calling the American Civil War in Poetry and Popular Song. Um, this is a topic that I both know a great deal about, but also care a great deal about. And what I'm trying to make the case for today is the ways that um, folks both in social studies and in ELA can use the really remarkable body of poetry uh, produced in and in response to the American Civil War. That is to say, poetry that was written between 1861 and 1865, but also the poetry uh, that came after the Civil War that brings us up even into our contemporary moment. Um, as all suggest, the Civil War was not just a massive historical event, it's also a massive cultural event. And as many historians suggest, in some ways the Civil War is still being fought, uh, uh, if not on the battle, field, uh, on the battlefields of cultural memory, of the ways that people remember and think about the war. And in both cases, both the battlefield and the sort of cultural front, uh, I think poetry has played and will continue to play a really dynamic role going forward. So I have broken my talk into three sections. Uh, I will be um, reading uh, several of my favorite poems. I've also given you all a, a handout, a sort of mini anthology of uh, Civil War poems that I think teach especially well, things that can be dropped into, again, not just literature and language courses and English courses, but also into history courses um, and offer a sort of uh, maybe more, again, dynamic um, and in some ways nuanced account of the war, how it was fought, how civilians in particular responded to it, and especially the ways in which uh, the war has continued to be a theme and topic uh, well into our contemporary moment. So the three sections of the talk, uh, I'm going to start by talking about why poetry, making a sort of defense for why poetry and popular song, its close kin, um, were so central to the Civil War and its aftermath. Um, we'll then look at some specific poems in a section that cribs a title from Walt Whitman, Beat Beat Drums. And I'll conclude with a, a brief consideration of uh, the ways in which the American Civil War continues to be uh, a poetic topic into the 21st century. I'll also there give some really practical, straightforward ways to approach teaching assignments around the poetry of the American Civil War. But let's get going. Why poetry and why popular song? When I teach poetry, uh, I usually begin with a moment of honesty, of truth, as it is emblazoned on uh, the main building at the University of Texas at Austin, the truth shall make you free. Um, for those of you watching this, I just want to know how many of you, show of hands, really hate poetry. I suspect that a number of you are raising your hands, especially if you uh, might be teaching uh, a social studies class where poetry feels daunting or something that is uh, especially elusive. Uh, that is often something that students and teachers uh, confess to, a truth they will tell, that poetry can be a bit daunting. I understand that. And so I want to begin with some very simple background on poetry, both why it teaches so well, why it's such an important part of the story of the American Civil War, um, and especially make the case for why we might include popular song alongside poetry, given what was going on in the 1860s and really even into our contemporary day. There's a long, long tradition of people hating poetry. Uh, a very famous and very excellent poet called Marianne Moore wrote a poem that I will read to you in its entirety. It is called Poetry, and the poem reads like this. I too dislike it. Reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it, one discovers in it, after all, a place for the genuine. It's a wonderfully ironic and nuanced little itty bitty poem, one that she would revise and expand over the course of her career. But I think more here is acknowledging uh, a truth that is often acknowledged, um, that folks really don't like poetry or have an ambivalence toward a fear of it. Uh, the poet and novelist Ben Lerner actually wrote an entire book called The Hatred of Poetry. Uh, and he notes in it that many more people agree that they hate poetry than agree what poetry is. He goes on to say, I too dislike it and have largely organized my life around it, be it with far less discipline and skill than Marion Moore, and do not experience that as a contradiction because poetry and the hatred of poetry are, for him, he says, and maybe for you, inextricable. I want to begin with this, again, just to acknowledge that elephant in the room, um, but also to suggest why this might be. And Lerner nails it here, um, that the sort of knee-jerk response against poetry um, also begs the question of what is poetry? What is it? How do we define it? 
um, that old maxim that I'll know it when I see it. What does poetry look like on the page? Um, definitions aren't all that helpful. The Oxford English Dictionary says that poetry is a composition in verse or some comparable pattern arrangement of language in which the expression of feelings and ideas is given intensity by the use of distinctive style and rhythm, the art of such a composition. I'll just note here um, something that Lerner himself says in The Hatred of Poetry. He actually thinks that poetry um, is a place where a lot of feeling and ideas are tried out. And that part of the resistance to poetry is that we have really, really outsized expectations. Let's think about those moments when you might encounter poetry in your daily lives if you're not a poetry lover, if you're not a poet or a teacher of poetry. And the answer are at really high stakes events like weddings and funerals, important events, inaugurations for presidents. Things like that are moments where we encounter, many of us, poetry in our day-to-day -day lives. And as Lerner would say, the stakes then are high. Uh, for this expressive art. That gets me to a slightly more um, ironic and I think quite funny definition of poetry. What is poetry? Uh, Wendy McLeod says, poetry is clumps of words that make people feel something. Clumps of words that make people feel something. I think that's right. And that's one of the reasons why I think we can look at a historical event like the American Civil War and gain a great deal by looking at the poetry of that event. When I teach poetry, uh, I just very quickly give this sort of way of approaching it. The first thing I say about poetry, there are four features. The first is economy. Poetry is predicated on economy. The idea that you will use a small clump of words uh, to produce or represent that feeling that McLeod is talking about. It's is not like prose, even prose poetry or long poems by figures like Walt Whitman that include a lot of words are still created with the idea of economy in mind, of removing unnecessary words, of really drawing attention to figuration, to images, to metaphor, um, by removing words that we would see in, say, a longer prose piece like a novel. So economy is the first feature. A second feature is estrangement, often because of the removal of uh, a more sort of prosaic, more, frankly, more words, uh, the result of that leads to a slightly strange way of expressing oneself, a slightly strange experience of reading. Um, this is often frustrating to some readers because it feels, again, like there's something elusive about it, that there's something um, that in reading it, you feel in some ways pushed away from the expression, pushed away from what the poet uh, or speaker is trying to convey. But again, in that estrangement, so often through that sort of strange experience of a poem, um, one can still sense and maybe better experience the emotion, uh, those clumps of words really capturing a feeling or emotion. Um, as a result of that, because emotion is often from you know, very, very romantic poems to very realistic poems, uh, since emotion is often at stake in a poem, I wanna suggest that poetry has an extraordinary explanatory power, especially historically. That is to say, by studying poems of the past, we can see how through economy, through estrangement, emotion is being expressed in a way that is then available to us, intelligible to us uh, over time and space. Those four features brought to you by the letter E, um, but I think they really kind of fundamentally help us to understand what poetry is, if not why so many of us hate it. I also will come to this at the end of the talk. Uh, I also think about poetry as both a culture and a conversation. That is to say, poetry is often in dialogue with other poems. Poems from a contemporary moment are just as often to look way back in time or across national borders to have a conversation. And as a result, there's a really robust culture around poetry that we'll see in practice in just a little bit. Okay, why is this important? It's important for the American Civil War that we have this understanding of poetry because the American Civil War from 1861 to 1865 and immediately after was an incredibly robust poetic culture. There was a lot of conversation going on, yes, across time and space, but also in the moment of the Civil War um, that really touched the lives of every American at that moment. Um, the editors of the Southern Literary Messenger, which was the most important literary uh, journal in the South uh, before, during, and frankly, after uh, the American Civil War, uh, the Miss Messenger was able to publish a, a very tongue-in-cheek, uh, but I think very revealing uh, note from the editor, which said this, 
we are receiving too much trash in rhyme. What is called poetry by its authors is not wanted. Fires are not accessible at this time of year, and it's too much trouble to tear up poetry. If it's thrown out the window, the vexatious wind always blows it back. I love this quotation. I've written about this quotation at some length because it represents, again, in the moment of the American Civil War, when uh, the country was rendered apart, when there was an increasingly bloody and cataclysmic war going on, people responded with poetry. They responded and put those emotions, that feeling into the durable form of poetry and as we'll see, popular song too. As a result, when you look at contemporary journals, especially like the Southern Literary Messenger, um, published in Richmond, Virginia, um, and again, a really important archive for feeling emotion in real time, in wartime in the South, you will find endless, endless numbers of poems. Not all of them good, as we'll see, um, but all of them, um, I think, offering a really powerful explanatory sense for what it felt like to be living through these very trying times. It's true of the Southern Literary Master. It's also true of Northern journals like Harper's Weekly, uh, shown here an early uh, image of um, uh, the firing on uh, Fort Sumter uh, and people responding to it in real time on the roofs uh, there in South Carolina. So in the South, in the North, both, there was this sense of there being too much, quote unquote, trash in rhyme, too much poetry, too strong a response, too many occasional uh, poems produced by people, again, in real time. The Southern Illustrated News, uh, an important illustrated newspaper, also includes just a ton of uh, poetry, as did Frank Leslie's Illustrated Newspaper in the North. To look over the pages of these periodicals, all of which are available online, all of which you can bring into your classrooms, um, you really find this remarkable archive of poetry that can be connected almost immediately to the historical events being described. Not just journals, magazines, not just newspapers, um, but also in sort of print forms like broadsides, you would find poetry that would be circulated hand to hand, perhaps as at events or as uh, commemorative items. You also start to see toward the midpoint and after of the Civil War, uh, an attempt to anthologize, to bring together um, this increasingly robust body of work. Um, here's two of my favorite examples. Frank Moore, uh, a very enterprising editor who produced kind of, as it were, warring anthologies, one called Lyrics of Loyalty, obviously sort of union-centric poetry, and on the other side, Rebel Rhymes and Rhapsodies. Um, offering, as it were, a fair and balanced approach uh, to the poetry of the American Civil War. Now, many uh, historians, especially, I would say, less so literary critics, but historians like Edmund Wilson have been pretty dismissive of um, the uh, quality of this verse. Wilson himself, a really um, important literary critic, um, just looked at the amount that was produced and kind of decided there wasn't a lot that was very good or of interest. He would say the period of the Civil War was not at all a favorable one for poetry. An immense amount of verse was written in connection with the war itself, but today it makes barren reading. I'll say that literary critics, historians uh, working together over the years, that was 1962 during the Civil War centennial, um, in the past 50 plus years, there's been a real attempt to push back on that and to really look at that immense amount of verse and suggest that, in fact, it, it's actually quite interesting, quite compelling, some really remarkable verse included in that immense outpouring, uh, the vexatious wind blowing it in, as the editor said. Connected to this, and something that further expands that archive of Civil War poetry, is to acknowledge that poetry and song were in this moment and have been for thousands of years deeply connected. Here's a, a pretty famous image of Homer uh, from the 18th century showing Homer performing his poems uh, with a musical accompaniment. The relations between poetry and song are deep and abiding, um, but especially in this moment, especially in uh, the American Civil War, there was a real sort of um, long before Bob Dylan, long before uh, there was a real insistence on um, and a real experimentation with setting the lyrics for um, uh, poetry to popular song. And this means that you could really in say a campsite 
um, bring together new poems, new songs by simply changing the words to the songs. Um, this really helps us to understand uh, what was going on in the Civil War period, uh, what is often called the singing 60s, the 1860s. Uh, Caroline Mosley, a, a wonderful musical historian, has said this, uh, that popular music was an integral part of many people's lives, much more so, more so than it is today. She goes on to note that first, there was not uh, the difference that exists today between popular and art song. Many of the same songs occur in sheet music, in books and songsters, and in the oral tradition. I think importantly here, she goes on to note, second, more people, regardless of sex and social station, sang out loud in front of other people than is customary today, and more in wartime than in time of peace. Let's remember that the American Civil War brought people together in really unprecedented ways. As a result of this, what we have are folks who have might never have left their small hometown traveling across the nation, getting together with an increasingly diverse uh, group of soldiers, for instance, or nurses, and spending time together, swapping stories, swapping songs, swapping poems. And the sort of diaries and documentary evidence suggests that people were often to pass the time, especially in camp, playing with the lyrics to songs, taking a popular poem and setting it to music so that everybody could sing along. Sometimes very earnest songs, sometimes very humorous songs. Done a lot of work on this. Um, I won't belabor it, but I will just note things like the Battle Hymn of the Republic um, begins life as a poem and then is set to a popular song, uh, a song that now many of us know, uh, the lyrics of which are kind of ingrained into our brain because of that relationship between uh, a, a poetic form and music. The ability to sing something um, to, say, a hymn form, for instance, um, can be a really powerful way to ensure that lyrics, that poetry, uh, has a sort of afterlife. This is true. Um, here is a, a little song sheet um, where you note that as sung by our volunteers, We Are For The Union, is then set to a tune. And you'll see this often um, on song sheets, in songsters, little books of song lyrics. They won't include the music, They'll just assume that the singer, the person holding the, the sheet or the book, will be will know the tune. And as a result, it's quite easy to just, even if you've never read or heard this poem before, to then set it to music. Here's a fascinating uh, example of a songster um, from uh, Richmond, Virginia, again, collecting songs from the South uh, during the Civil War. Again, books like this would not include any musical notation, just indicate what the tune, air, or melody was. In thinking about how robust this culture was, um, this is a document that I found in an archive at the Boston Athenaeum. It's fascinating because it is, as it says across the top there, additional lyrics to Bonnie Blue Flag as sung by the Missourians during the war. This is a manuscript version of lyrics to a song of a poem, let's be honest, that was then stuck inside of a collection of other lyrics. The person who did this clearly wanted to make sure that the song version they remembered, they uh, perhaps sang themselves, uh, was maintained for posterity. So that's the relationship between poetry and popular song. That's a, a sort of defense for why this stuff is so interesting, why it can be such a valuable thing in your classroom. From here, I just want to move fairly quickly through um, some of the poems that I've included in my handout that I encourage you to bring into your classrooms. I think every single poem in there teaches wonderfully well. I'm going to run quickly through some introductions to the poets I'll be talking about. I'm not going to belabor them, but because my PowerPoints are available to you, please feel free to use um, those biographical slides as a way to introduce these figures to your students. I think that can be a helpful way to make sure they know just enough about the person who uh, wrote the given poem uh, to be able to bring it into your classroom. So this is called Beat, Beat, Drums. The first poet I wanted to talk about because it's so central to the American Civil War to begin and end, as it were, with slavery and emancipation is the great Frances Ellen Watkins Harper. Again, I won't belabor her biography except to say that she was raised in a family of free Blacks um, and had a really long and prolific writing career, one that begins before the American Civil War and goes all nearly to into the early part of the 21st or 20th century. Why is that important? Because her poetry and her oratory um, responds in a really helpful way to 
the antebellum period, the Civil War period, Reconstruction, and after. And you can really read her work as an index of those massive changes in American life. The other thing that I love about Harper, well, I think she teaches so well, was because she was um, a poet, yes, and a very, very um, interesting and, and dynamic poet, but also an orator and was really renowned in her time um, for her speeches. So for those of you that are trying to incorporate oratory into your classes, it can be great to include some of these poems, which she would often read aloud at her speeches uh, as part of her broader project. My favorite of her poems is called Bury Me in a Free Land, which dates to before the American Civil War, but she would continue to perform uh, and republish throughout her long writing career, even after the American Civil War. I'll just give you the first and a uh, couple stanzas and, uh, and then we'll move on. Bury me in a free land. Make me a grave, where you will, in a lowly plain or a lofty hill. Make it among the earth's humblest graves, but not in a land where men are slaves. I could not rest if around my grave I heard the steps of a trembling slave. His shadow above my silent tomb would make it a place of fearful gloom. I could not rest if I heard the tread of a coffle gan to the shambles led, and the mother's shriek of wild despair rise like a curse on the trembling air. I could not sleep if I saw the lash drinking her blood at each fearful gash, and I saw the babes torn from her breast like trembling doves from their parent nest. The poem then ends, I ask no monument, proud and high, to arrest the gaze of the passers-by. All that my yearning spirit craves is bury me not in a land of slaves. When I teach this poem, my students often respond um, to Harper's really remarkable use of imagery, um, the sort of steady structure of the poem, both a fairly regular metrical pattern, but also a, a predictable rhyme scheme that she does great things with, drawing in unexpected rhymes. What I like about the poem, though, again, is the ways in which it is, yes, representative of a poet who wrote across the antebellum, bellum, and postbellum United States, but also somebody who is clearly thinking about the relationship between the past and the future. Again, bury me in a free land. This is somebody who is asking for a future United States, a post-Civil War United States, in which, as she says, all men, all people are free. Another poet, obviously, uh, that, that is traditionally taught uh, in both literature and history classes around the Civil War is Walt Whitman, um, a poet who described himself as the poet of the body, the poet of the soul, the poet of democracy, and whose life and poetic project were massively upended by the American Civil War. Whitman would actually say, even though he published several versions of Leaves of Grass before the Civil War, he would say that the his book project, Leaves of Grass, would end up being all about the war. And indeed, his experience uh, in between 1861 and 1865 absolutely had a profound effect on him, uh, as we'll see, not least because he had a sort of personal relationship to the war. Um, but because in the middle of this writing career that begins in 1855 uh, with Leaves of Grass and goes all the way till his death, um, we can really read the Civil War as a pivot point. And he produced some of the most, um, I think, enduring poems uh, from the period, which he would then revise and revisit across the rest of his life. Um, when I teach Whitman Civil War, I teach an entire class on Whitman and Dickinson. The Civil War is central there. Um, I draw attention to the fact that uh, Whitman was, in his own words, a soldier's missionary. Uh, after finding out that his brother um, had been, um, he worried, grievously injured, he was only minorly injured uh, in the American Civil War, Whitman actually went to the front, was in Virginia, and then in Washington, D.C., volunteering as a nurse and, as he says, missionary for soldiers, talking to them, um, bringing them treats, taking down letters for them, and the like. He was also, because of the time he spent during the Civil War in Washington, D.C., um, quite enamored of Abraham Lincoln, who he would write about at length, both in prose and uh, in poetry. And again, I also emphasize the fact that Whitman, once experiencing the American Civil War, would spend the rest of his life really trying to incorporate his experiences, his, the historical trauma, into his broader poetic project. 
It's a ton of material we can work with here. Uh, I won't belabor it except to say, here's a great quotation uh, from the 1880s when he talks about um, his experiences in those Washington hospitals. This is um, drawing on diaristic um, accounts, things he was writing down in real time, but it is a retrospective account. He says, I go around from one case to another. I do not see that I do much good to these wounded and dying, but I cannot leave them. Once in a while, some youngster holds on to me convulsively, but I do what I can for him. At any rate, stop with him and sit near him for hours if he wishes it. So this is really frontline stuff in the hospitals with wounded Union soldiers, um, sometimes even with wounded rebel soldiers. He is there giving a sort of um, comfort and aid um, in this increasingly intimate way uh, where he's really able to think about the costs of war, think about the cause in a thoroughgoing way. We have remarkable uh, evidence from this. This is a letter um, written by Whitman that is in his hand. Um, we think for a soldier who was so injured uh, he couldn't write the letter himself. He, the, he may not also have been fully literate. And so Whitman is writing, as it were, in the voice of um, the soldier. This is a, a lovely uh, letter that I hope you all will be able to spend some time with after the case. I'll just note um, that David Ferguson um, died before the letter actually could reach his wife. Um, again, bringing home um, the really cataclysmic uh, experience of war. Whitman would then take these experiences, especially in a poem um, called The Dresser that teaches wonderfully well, um, and turns those experiences in Washington, D.C. hospitals into verse, into poetry uh, that teaches very well. He also would, again, come back and write about the war at length. Um, he became closely associated with the war because of his uh, poetry, prose, and oratory. He gave a lot of speeches, uh, especially on Abraham Lincoln. Uh, after Lincoln's assassination, Whitman would write the extraordinarily powerful uh, elegies, O Captain, My Captain, and When Lilacs Last and Dory Yard Bloomed. But he would also um, recite those poems in the context of giving speeches on Whitman, on uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, well into, as we see here, um, the 1880s. There's a manuscript version of O Captain, My Captain. Um, it was such a popular poem that Whitman would sell these versions or give gift these versions um, so that people could have uh, a version of the poem in Whitman's own hand. But it is the collection Drum Taps, which he published in 1865. He actually added a brief sequel um, later that same year um, that really constitutes, I think, the most teachable and sustained meditation on the Civil War in Whitman's corpus. Um, again, easily available online. All the poems, um, I think, teach exceptionally well. Uh, my favorites uh, in the poem, uh, in the book, I've included here on the slides, but also in your handout. The first is called A March in the Ranks, Hard Pressed and the Road Unknown, which captures powerfully, I think, the experience of marching, of experiencing trauma as a soldier, of being in um, in this case, a field hospital and seeing all the death and devastation that the war produced and then being forced, as the poem goes on, to continue marching. Um, it's a, a really astonishing poem that students especially respond well to. And in my own uh, experience, uh, veterans uh, have a, an especially um, uh, incisive experience of. Poem that I'll read for you that I also think teaches wonderfully well and, and, and gets us to connect back to the issues of slavery and emancipation, um, but also the post-Civil War moment, uh, what happened when this horrific war finally came to an end. Reconciliation. Word over all, beautiful as the sky, beautiful that war in all its deeds of carnage must in time be utterly lost. That the hands of the sisters, death and night, incessantly, softly wash again and ever again this soiled world. For my enemy is dead. A man divine as myself is dead. I look where he lies, white-faced and still, in the coffin. I draw near. I bend down and touch lightly with my lips the white face in the coffin. Again, I think this is a, a, a really powerful short poem for those of you that are concerned about, do I really have the time to teach a lot of this? 
a short poem like Reconciliation can really help to capture, yes, the feeling and emotion, um, but also some of the challenges of a post-war reconciliation. Um, my students often note here the, that whiteness is, is emphasized several times in a short poem. Um, and this really does seem to be about North and South, white North and white South reconciling. Um, but again, if taught in relation to, say, Harper's Barry Mean Freeland, you can do a lot with thinking about um, the causes, costs, and benefits of this massive historical event. I'm going to move very quickly through these um, so as to not take too much of your time. Um, uh, just acknowledging that other major poets from the period, like Herman Melville, um, would respond to the Civil War in pretty remarkable ways and more or less in real time. Um, Melville largely abandons fiction um, as we come into the 1860s. And actually, his first major poetic publication is a collection called Battle Pieces and Aspects of War from 1866. It's clear that he was reading very um, voraciously what was going on, contemporary accounts of the Civil War. He even made a couple trips out to the front. He had lots of connections, as most Americans did, to um, what was happening on the battlefield. And his poetry, although sometimes difficult um, and often deeply ironic, his poetry, I think, teaches exceptionally well. I've given you a couple of poems here. One called Shiloh, a Requiem, um, which has um, one of the great lines in all of American Civil War poetry in a parenthetical. He says, what like a bullet can undeceive? Uh, again, I think someone like Melville does really well to think philosophically about, um, again, costs and causes of the war um, and can also sort of, you know, puncture some of the, beating, beating of the drums, as Whitman calls it, um, by really emphasizing, uh, often through irony, uh, just how harrowing uh, the experience of war was. Another poem that I think teaches very well is called America. I'm giving the whole text in your handout. Um, this is a sort of extended uh, metaphor allegory, uh, uh, turning America into a figure. Um, I think it's a very powerful poem that can help think about representation, can help think again about um, what a post-war America would look like once the South had been defeated and was brought forcibly back into the Union, um, what sort of future was to come. Another poet that I think is often neglected in conversations about the American Civil War is Emily Dickinson. And part of that neglect has to do with the fact that um, Dickinson's poetry is very elusive. It's often hard to know exactly what she's referring to. And yet, during the American Civil War, she wrote, did not publish, she only published about a dozen poems in her life, but she wrote a massive number. Of the 1,800 poems that we have, uh, a good portion are published during, or completed, sorry, uh, during uh, the American Civil War. She also had a really intimate connection, as again, so many Americans did, to the experience of war. Um, she was a voracious reader, even if we have that image of her as a recluse, as somebody who never left her house. Um, she was actually in deep conversation through print culture, through journals, through newspaper accounts, and also through correspondence. As we'll see, she was really well connected. Her father was a U.S. congressman. Um, her literary mentor was on the front lines uh, during the Civil War. She was also very connected through her community of Amherst, Massachusetts, with what was going on during the war. She even did some fundraising during the Civil War, um, sending off some poems. Uh, we don't know how totally involved she was in that, but she was at least uh, part of a cause to raise uh, money for uh, soldier relief uh, groups. And then we have this massive body of poems that really do suggest uh, uh, that she is thinking about and responding to this historical event in very thoroughgoing ways. This is an image of Fraser Stearns. Um, there's a lot written online about Dickinson's relationship to this um, young man who was, a, again, an Amherst, Massachusetts uh, a volunteer who went off to fight the war and was killed. And it had a massive effect on the whole family. Uh, Fraser was very close with uh, Dickinson's brother. Um, and we start to see uh, in the correspondence, especially the ways in which Dickinson is representing the family and community grief at the loss of this young man. 
Again, here is a, a, a short-lived little uh, newspaper called The Drumbeat in Brooklyn. As you see there, it's the benefit for the US Sanitary Commission. And we don't totally understand how involved Dickinson was in the authorization of this, but at least three of her poems appeared in that short-lived journal, um, again, intended to raise funds, social relief groups, um, and so this is three of the, we think, dozen poems that Dickinson published during her life are published during the Civil War in a Civil War uh, relief publication. But when we look at the poems themselves, I do think we can clearly see as difficult as it is to figure out what exactly Dickinson is referring to, when you read a poem like It Feels a Shame to Be Alive, finished in the 1860s, it's impossible not to see that she must be responding in some way, however oblique, to the American Civil War. It feels a shame to be alive when men so brave are dead. One envies the distinguished dust permitted such a head. The stone that tells defending whom the Spartan put away, what little of him we possessed in pawn for liberty. The price is great, sublimely paid. Do we deserve a thing that lives like dollars must be piled before we may obtain? Are we that wait sufficient worth that such enormous pearl as life dissolved be for us in battle's horrid bowl? It may be a renown to live. I think the man who die, those unsustained saviors, present divinity. Again, all the challenges of teaching Dickinson, of getting students to respond to uh, her form, those dashes, the sort of strange ways that enjambment works, it's all there. This is not a immediately straightforward poem. But some of those images are absolutely powerful and moving even in our contemporary moment. There is also a broader question being asked here about, as she says, the price of liberty, what it means to pawn lives for liberty. Dickinson, um, given the politics, I think we can see her as being relatively progressive in her time, but she is thinking about the costs of war. Even if she and many of these writers are totally confident in the justness of the war, uh, what we start to see in some of this poetry is what it feels like to lose people that many of these poets knew and knew well. Um, where the costs for this deeply just war for emancipation end up being um, reckoned in the poetry. I think it's, a, a, again, a really helpful poem. Another one um, that is a little more obscure, but I think is helping us to think is something like they drop like flakes, they drop like stars, like petals from a rose, when suddenly across the June, a window, a wind with fingers goes. They perished in the seamless grass. No eye could find the place, but God can summon every face on his repealist list. Once you start to see the Civil War in Dickinson's poetry, it's kind of everywhere. Again, even if the address is not as direct, I think these poems can easily be brought in and your students can helpfully uh, respond to them. See, where are you noting in this poem written during the American Civil War or even after, where might we see the sort of echoes or ghosts of that war? I'm going to connect here um, to briefly a, a figure called Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who was not himself a poet, but was a very interesting writer, um, sort of one of these world's most interesting men of the 19th century. He was kind of everywhere uh, during the 19th century. He had a number of interesting posts, including he was um, a, an important editor and writer for literary magazines like the Atlantic Monthly. Um, he was also Dickinson's mentor. He exchanged a series of letters and met her several times. He became her first important um, posthumous uh uh, publisher. He, working with uh, Mabel Loomis Todd, a family member, helped to bring out the first two collections of Dickinson poetry. And their correspondence started during the Civil War, while he was leading one of the first Black regiments in the Civil War, uh, the first South Carolina regiment, um, which saw action in Florida and in South Carolina. So he's actually taking time out of war to write to this young, obscure, reclusive figure in Amherst, Massachusetts, called Emily Dickinson. As importantly, Higginson is um, leading this group of soldiers 
and really taking note as he does almost ethnographically of what their experiences of war were like. He'll publish a, a fabulous book called Army Life in a Black Regiment um, in the late 1860s, where among other things, he records the sorts of songs that were being sung in camp. And this brings us back to that relationship between poetry and song, it brings us back to the idea um, that poetry and song during this moment, maybe in our own moment, um, are deeply linked. I've given you this whole essay um, in the Google Classroom. I hope you all will be able to spend some time with it. Um, what I'll just say is that the, the essay, which appeared initially in Atlantic Monthly, called Negro Spirituals, um, Higginson really sort of emphasizes the poetic quality of um, these songs that they're singing. And as you see represented there, many of these uh, lyrics are represented in the piece. Um, and students can start to think about this as another form of Civil War poetry, Civil War poetry um, that is connected to both Black religious traditions and to the sort of robust performances that were um, used to pass time uh, for many of these Black soldiers in uh, camp. So fabulous essay. It's an endlessly interesting topic. Um, these get picked up, as you all may well know, by people like W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, there are a series of post-Civil War anthologies of these songs and of the lyrics. Um, and Higginson is right there with his close connections to folks like Dickinson and Whitman. He is clearly um, adding to the robustness and the diversity of this archive. Okay, well, one last little bit here, um, and just to suggest that uh, the expanse we're talking about, um, uh, a major figure in the U.S. South was somebody called William Gilmore Sims. Um, I haven't included any of his poetry here, but I'm going to acknowledge um, his really important post-Civil War anthology called War Poetry of the South. Um, Sims uh, was ardently pro-slavery. Um, he moved in the course of his life from a really robust American literary nationalism to secessionism. He supported the Confederacy. Um, and yet at the end of the war, um, came back in, used a New York publisher uh, to bring together um, an anthology and a crucial anthology of Confederate poetry, of which, as you see here, there were many, many started to be published in the Civil War and come up all the way into the 20th century. What I like about Sims's uh, War Poetry of the South is its kind of knowingness and the, its ability to capture uh, a whole range of poems from high literary art to popular song, all included in the same anthology. He considered this anthology um, as being a contribution to a national literature, as he says in the introduction. He assumes that it is not going to be unworthy of it. And just note the language with which he describes the rationale for publishing the poetry of a defeated people, a people who were, to be clear, trying desperately to maintain the institution of slavery. He goes on to say, um, it constitutes a contribution to a national literature, which is assumed to not be unworthy of it, and which is otherwise valuable as illustrating the degree of mental and art development, which has been made in a large section of the country under circumstances greatly, greatly calculated to stimulate talent and provoke expression through the higher utterances of passion and imagination. He's offering us these poems, this big anthology of poems, not necessarily as a sort of excuse or apology, um, but I think as a, a representative of, again, the emotion, the feeling that might have produced not just all these poems, but also all the bodies, all the, the fact that the South was willing to fight so fiercely for so long uh, as the losses mounted and mounted. He really thinks of this almost sociologically as something that future generations can look back on, maybe to better understand uh, the American Civil War, again, its causes and costs. I won't belabor it here, but one of the most popular poems is at the center of this anthology by Sims, um, written by a uh, Someone called Abram Joseph Ryan, Father Ryan, a, a Catholic um, priest who suggested at the end of the Civil War that it was time to put away the Confederate uh, flag. Furl that banner for tis weary, round its staff tis drooping dreary. Furl it, fold it, it is best, for there's not a man to wave it. There's not a sword to save it. There's no one left to lave it in the blood that heroes gave it. And its foes now scorn and brave it. Furl it, hide it let it rest. I've taught this poem a lot. Um, 
teaching the poetry of the bad guys and the losers, I think can be really instructive. My students tend to respond well to this, not least because it's a lament, right? This is clear that the South is lost and uh, there's no sort of, the poem does have a certain kind of lost cause ideology, a sort of celebration of, again, the bravery of its heroes. Um, I th think students can respond well to seeing um, what the experience of defeat was like and how defining it was for the South. Um, I'll just note that this on your right, the image there is of, say it with me, music that accompanied the poetry. Almost immediately this popular poem gets set to music and a number of different musical settings uh, and remains a sort of popular part of Southern culture uh, well into the 20th century. Okay, y'all, I'm gonna wrap up here um, by talking very, very briefly and kind of gesturally uh, about the ditch is near about post-Civil War and even 20th and 21st century um, sort of uh, leftovers, uh, 20th and 21st century echoes, ghosts of Civil War in poetry. Uh, that might not totally describe how dynamic and central uh, the Civil War is to American poetry. It's not just for people who lived through the war. In fact, in a lot of ways, some of the best poetry written about the American Civil War was written by successive generations. Again, if we think about poetry as a culture, as a conversation, I think the, the most dynamic uh, form of that is in the ways that poets talk to one another over time, across space, across politics, ideology, beliefs, we can really see that poetry provides the sort of language for that culture and conversation. My favorite examples of this uh, are a series of poems that you have in your handouts. Um, the first was written by Alan Tate. Um, and that poem, I think, although difficult and long, it is a very long poem, um, comes from 1928. It's called Ode to the Confederate Dead. Um, that poem was considered for its time um, an extraordinarily moving poem. It is a bit of an apology for the South. And um, as a result of that, despite its poetic grandeur, um, it led to a lot of backlash in the successive years. Uh, certainly by the time that Robert Lowell, uh, beginning in 1960 and finishing in 1964, writes a poem that plays with the title uh, and responds directly to Tate, who had been an important uh, model and even uh, mentor for Lowell, Lowell writes, uh, again, during not just the Civil War centennial, 1961 to 1965, but also during the height of the civil rights moment, a poem called For the Union Dead, which meditates on the memory of Black soldiers during the Civil War, especially the Massachusetts 54th. Um, it's my favorite poem of all time, period, full stop. Uh, I think it teaches exceptionally well. It is a moving meditation on the relationship between the Civil War and civil rights. It spans that whole period in between and really captures powerfully um, the speaker's experience of history in real time. Um, it is just an astonishing, astonishing piece of art, and I recommend it highly to you. Even if you aren't going to be able to teach it, I want you to experience that poem in the conversation it is a part of, which begins with Alan Tate, in 1928, goes to Lowell and then finds a further expression in a contemporary African-American poet called Kevin Young, who is fabulous. Um, Young responds to both Tate and to Lowell in a poem uh, from 2007 called For the Confederate Dead, bringing together uh, the two previous poems and responding to them, uh, and also Walt Whitman in passing, uh, in, a, in a really, really extraordinary way. So we're seeing this as um, a, a, an index of how central poetry is to our understanding of the Civil War, and frankly, how central the Civil War remains in American poetry. It, it's, again, almost by this point, by the, you start to see these conversations over time. Tate is responded to by Lowell, who's responded to by Young. Um, it becomes a topic that many poets want to reckon with. Many, even if they have a fairly attenuated relationship to the war itself, um, want to come back to as a poetic figure, as a topic, as something where they can um, put themselves in that conversation, in that culture, uh, and add something new to. My favorite example, and the last I'll give you today, is by Natasha Trethway, who is um, one of my favorite uh, poets, um, continuing to produce just really, really um, rewarding 
lyrics. All of her poetry teaches well, um, not least because she has that kind of uh, super continuous understanding of history, especially Southern history. Um, as the daughter of a mixed race marriage, uh, somebody who's thought a lot about the Gulf Coast of Mississippi, um, who's thought a lot about Civil War history as Civil War history. Um, my favorite of her books is called uh, Native Guard. It was published in 2006 and wins the Pulitzer Prize. Um, all of the poems in this are moving back and forth over time, talking about her own experiences of family trauma in relationship to things like the Civil War and the Civil Rights era. My favorite of the poems in there is called Pilgrimage. Uh, I won't read it to you because of time, but I'll just say that uh, I think the poem, which teaches like a dream, really helps to bring its speaker back in time um, while describing the experience of going to, uh, making a pilgrimage to Vicksburg, Mississippi, um, where the speaker describes um, the ongoing uh, nature of the Civil War, the ongoing contested memory of the Civil War, um, is in some ways uh, not just uh, not just important, uh, but in some ways oppressive. The poem ends uh, after meditating on a number of things, including the Civil War history of uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi, with a powerful uh, line. At the museum, we marvel at their clothes preserved under glass, so much smaller than our own as if those who wore them were only children. We sleep in their beds, the old mansions hunkered on the bluffs, draped in flowers, funereal, a blur of petals against the river's gray. The brochure in my room calls this living history. The brass plate on the door reads Prissy's room. A window frames the river's crawl toward the gulf. In my dream, the ghost of history lies down beside me rolls over, pins me beneath a heavy arm. It's such a haunting image, the ghost of history, um, sort of oppressively laying that arm heavily over the speaker, who has just had a, a not great experience of living history, being placed in a room, Chrissy's room, that brings in the sort of racist history of Civil War memory, especially uh, Gone with the Wind. Uh, but my students respond so well to this kind of back and forth, as with Lowell, as with Kevin Young, uh, across time and space to really draw together um, not just the experience of Civil War, but the experience of Civil War over time. Some images that I teach with this poem, this is Vicksburg um, and the cave system that was uh, many uh, white Southerners uh, retreated to while the city was under siege. Um, here's a contemporary image from a, a illustrated newspaper showing um, some of these Vicksburg residents living in that those caves or relocating to those caves. Um, obviously, Gone with the Winds um, can help explain that reference to Prissy and thinking again about the very contested uh, history of how the Civil War has been remembered. It's also a way for us to come up to contemporary debates about how best to live with this traumatic, if eventually redemptive, history of the American Civil War. So I'm going to end there. I'll just um, emphasize here some suggestions for further readings. Um, both Edward Hirsch and Cheryl Waleski's um, guides to poetry, especially for those of you that are uh, anti-poetry, poetry haters, or poetry uh, phobic, I think both those are really helpful um, uh, on ramps to studying and teaching poetry. The best single contemporary anthology of Civil War poetry is called Words for the Hour, um, co-edited by Faith Barrett and Chris Ann Miller. Um, Barrett's own study of the Civil War poetry is, I think, the best uh, available. It's called To Fight Aloud is Very Brave. I also really admire Christian McWhorter's study of the power and popularity of music in the Civil War. That's called Battle Hymns. Also given you a series of um, links that you can go to where all of um, the sources that I've talked about today are available online, the Hathi Trust, Chronicle King America, which looks at historic newspapers, and especially the Dickinson and Whitman archives, which offer um, really remarkable access, digital access um, to some of these poems. I'll just identify here some um, 
popular assignments, assignments that I've done well with over the years um, that my students seem to respond well to um, that focus on Civil War poetry and popular song. Um, one thing, because we're talking about this robust archive, one thing I will often do is crowdsource, have my students go find a Civil War poem or song, either in an anthology or a periodical. Uh, I find that that gets them invested in doing some sort of primary research. It also, they will often bring back some strange object that we don't know much about the poet. It might be anonymous. It might be a humorous poem. It might be an elegy. Um, and their sort of work in discovering it and discovering it in its place, like looking at a poem in a newspaper that might cover a contemporary moment in the Civil War, uh, especially uh, pivotal battle, for instance, we can see how poetry is responding again in real time to these historical events. Southern Illustrated News is great for this, um, as are a number of other uh, digital archives that are available online. I also like to have, um, to get back to the form of poetry, uh, ask students to memorize or recite a Civil War poem or song. Um, this can be a really powerful way for them to live with a poem, to have the poem in their body, as it were. Helps us to get back to things like Poetry Out Loud, the very popular uh, recitation and memorization um, activity that many schools are invested in. Um, because Civil War poetry is so diverse and there's so much of it, endless opportunities um, to get students to uh, find a poem, memorize it, and then perform it. Because of everything I've said about setting poetry to music, how easy that is to do, you can easily take some of these popular poems, some of the even very famous poems from the Civil War, and set them to music. I think that goes very, very well. Um, we get back to Dickinson and the famous Can You Sing? I Could Not Stop to Death for uh, the Eyes of Texas. Uh, many of her poems can indeed be set to popular tunes, again, because of the form involving there. Um, the Yellow Rose of Texas this is also a good one because I could not stop for death. He kindly stopped for me, the carriage held, but just ourselves and immortality. I'm going to stop there. But um, again, because of those historic relations between poetry and song, it can be really easy for your students to take a contemporary popular song and set the lyrics from a Civil War song to it. Um, there's a ton also of contemporary versions of this. Um, Ken Burns soundtrack uh, for the Civil War, PBS documentary Songs of the Civil War, but also uh, a Texas version of this, Dark River Songs of the Civil War era, interpretations by Austin's finest musicians. Um, this can help uh, students to feel like this stuff is relevant, is still with us into the contemporary moment. Always encouraging my students to rewrite or reimagine a Civil War poem or song. Um, had great luck with this. Um, have on the PowerPoint there one of the prompts uh, I use at the University of Texas to get students to go back and reimagine a, a familiar or famous uh, poem and bring it into the contemporary moment. Uh, my colleague Evan and I have had good luck with this over the years, um, including having one of our former students um, publish the poetry he produced for our class uh, on social media, uh, again, taking a uh, famous 20th century poem and bringing it, as it were, into the 21st century. That can be especially helpful in thinking about the legacy of the Civil War if you were uh, working to bring an 1860s poem, for instance, into the 2020s. Social annotation is very big these days. I think this can be a nice way to get students to engage with um, what they might initially think is an old or old fashioned text. Um, using some of the tools that are available for free online, uh, including Hypothesis and even Genius, um, where they can go from not just Drake lyrics, but also to the poetry of the American Civil War. If there's a robust poetic culture, there's also a really robust um, visual art culture around the Civil War that, again, is from its own moment, but it comes all the way up to the contemporary moment. Um, Civil War continues to be um, uh, a topic, an event, uh, an iconography that artists are very interested in. So it's really easy to pair, for instance, um, famous uh, photographs like this by John Rickey and Alexander Gardner, um, titled A Burial Party, Cold Harbor, Virginia. I think this poem really captures um, some of the uncelebrated labor, um, some of the really horrifying labor that especially here um, Black folks were uh, made to clean up some of the Civil War battlefields. Um, this pairs wonderfully well with some of the poems that we've discussed today, but also a number of contemporary poems that think about um, Black involvement in the fight for emancipation. It's also 
figures like Winslow Homer, who did a lot during the Civil War. Um, and in fact, uh, a, an image like this, um, which is called uh, The Veteran in a New Field from 1865, showing, it says, a veteran returning to farm work after the Civil War. Um, this poem is picked up on by many people, or this image is picked up on by many people, including Natasha Trathaway, who writes uh, a fabulous poem in Native Guard um, that is an ekphrastic poem, something that's responding to Homer's image here and thinking about that return to a post-war world. Um, contemporary folks, um, this is a guy called Gayline uh, Schnalik, who I think is terrific. Um, he's taking a photographic image from the Civil War and connecting it to a Whitman poem. This uh, teaches beautifully as a text pair. Um, even something, this kind of very intense image by a contemporary artist called Barnaby Furness. This is uh, an image we're told of Antietam um, where he's bringing a very, very contemporary and kind of postmodern sensibility to representing the Civil War. Finally, um, I think because of everything we've discussed, it's really easy to compare Civil War poems or songs over time. And I've already suggested a little bit of this with our um, emphasis on the relation between Alan Tate, Robert Lowell, and Kevin Young. Um, but that is not the limit by any stretch of the imagination. There are so many poets um, that can be brought into a conversation around the topic of the Civil War, its memory and importance. Um, this is just one text pair that I think teaches beautifully, uh, but it is by no means the only. I will stop there. Thank you for your time. Um, thank you for your teaching and all that you do uh, for your students. I hope this has been helpful, and I hope it's at the very least uh, I've made a compelling case for why the poetry of the American Civil War, both produced in that period and up to our contemporary moment, is so vibrant, so diverse, so interesting, and helpful in the classroom for you and for your students. Thanks so much.